as many as we're going to get. Um, and I know people will probably continue to be coming in, and um, there'll be some shuffling around, but we'll, we'll work through that. Um, I'm Matt Greenwell. I'm the head of the department here at UT Chattanooga. And uh, I want to welcome all of you here tonight um, to the UTC Department of Art for the second season of the John and Diane Merritt Visiting Artists Lecture Series. Uh, this Visiting Artists program, many of you know, we've uh, been to uh, some earlier programming, uh, strives to bring nationally and internationally recognized contemporary artists to Chattanooga and to Chattanooga's Crest Gallery of Art. This program continues to have an immeasurable impact on our academic programs through events like this and through the variety of studio visits and classroom visits and informal critiques and contact uh, with our students that these artists have as a part of their regular program uh, for this series. But through John and Diane's vision, this program is more than about just UTC. It's about this pretty extraordinary city in which we live, a city that has truly embraced the arts, a city that has been and continues to be, I think, visionary in its understanding of the vital social and cultural and economic role that the arts play in our lives and in our community. John and Diane have played a fundamental role in cultivating this community through their ongoing support of a, a wide range of programs and initiatives, which I'm really proud to say now includes UTC and the Department of Art. As many of you know, I'm committed to positioning this department as a central and vital part of the artistic life of this city. And the John and Diane Merrick Visiting Artists Lecture Series allows us to realize this goal in a real and fundamental way. So on behalf of the faculty, staff, and students of the UTC Department of Art, on the behalf of this institution and of this city, I'd like for John and Diane to stand up just for a second. <laughs> Insofar as this program uh, is going to be measured through its action, it really is Ruth Rover who deserves the credit. Uh, Ruth is the director of the Press Gallery of Art and its collections, and it is her, more than anyone, who has made this vision a reality. Through her tireless commitment to the department, through her gallery programming, through her commitment and her relationships with the artist whom she brings here, uh, and uh, to the students who those artists serve while they're here on campus. Uh, with that, I'd like to turn it over to Ruth, who's going to uh, to introduce the artists and talk a little bit more about the uh, the events tonight. Thank you, Ruth. And I too would like to welcome all of you here tonight. This is a wonderful house, uh, full of artists and. Um, arts appreciators and arts collectors and all, all kinds of people who care and love visual arts and realize the important place that they play in our lives. And to that extent, you are all a part of a continuum, uh, and a continuum and a tradition, I hope, that will carry on a long time here in Chattanooga and in the Southeast region. Um, tonight, the Crest Gallery of Art, of course, we see images here from the installation, the installation which began on Friday. <coughs> The exhibition, the idea of the exhibition, actually began in uh, July of 2006 uh, when I walked up to look at Ryan Wolf's work at the Scope Hamptons Art Fair. And standing back, away from it, I turned around and saw Mark Andreas. Disney came on board about a year later. And, uh, and today, in 2008, we are really very fortunate with John and Diane's help to bring them to campus and uh, to also bring their work here to the press gallery. Um, three exhibitions that the gallery will feature tonight explore new trends in 21st century sculpture and reference today's sciences and recent technologies of physics, the computation, computational mathematics, and engineering and digital systems as they interrelate as they interrelate um, with society's philosophical discourses and the visual arts. Uh, Mark Andreas brings us transcendence and we're doing this in alphabetic order. Um, Mark 
studied at the School of the Art Institute in Boston, Massachusetts, and the School of Visual Arts in New York City. Uh, as a teenager, he spent summers working at his uncle's boatyard in Germany, and following uh, college and various worked at various boatyards on the coast of Connecticut, constructing and repairing marine vessels. Uh, he continues to work independently as a master craftsman, uh, fabricating custom cabinetry, furniture, and metal architectural adornment. His exhibitions include uh, um, Art Istanbul in Turkey, Singularity in the Communal Tide, uh, Flamingo South Sculpture Beach, Flamingo South Beach Sculpture Garden, Scope Miami in Southeast Florida, <coughs> Back to Nature, Contemporary Arts Center of North Adams, Massachusetts, Newark Between Us, Stanford, Connecticut, and Seed Spreader Dam Stool Trader Gallery. From New York. Um, he is currently represented by Dan Stuhl Trader in, uh, in, uh, in Brooklyn, and he maintains a studio in the city of Stanford, Connecticut, where he lives with his wife Kate, a lawyer, buddy, and family dog. Uh, so I think in, in order to do this, I'll go ahead and bring Mark up, and then we'll introduce the next artist. Mark. years it's taken to get to this point and of course uh, John and Diane for uh, making this possible so that we could all, all do this and um, yeah it's been it's been a great uh, few days I'm looking for the, for the rest of my uh, remainder of my time here the next three days or so and uh, see how much uh, how much time we can spend with all of you and, and the rest of Chattanooga and take it all in so um, yeah this is uh, this is my uh, this is seed spreader this is a piece. Uh, this is actually in, uh, in the Flamingo uh, Sculpture Garden in uh, South Beach. But um, this uh, this piece was what, one of my first uh, pieces that I made getting out of um, getting out of school. <laughs> yeah. But um, so kind of how I got to this point was uh, in art school. At the first couple of years, I wasn't really sure exactly what I knew, and then uh, I got into the uh, metal shop, and I realized that this was. Uh, going to be what I'm going to have to do for the rest of my life to be a sculptor. It just, it just came obvious to me. So for the last 12 years or so, I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to actually go about doing that. And um, I realized before I made this that um, staying in New York wasn't really going to be great for me to be able to try to hold down a studio and, and get things going uh, at, uh, without really any any trade or craft uh, to be able to, to do this with. So uh, I decided to um, head out to Colorado and um, start getting a job as a carpenter and, um, get, uh, and start making this. And so over a two year period out there, I learned carpentry and I learned um, how to make this. And then came back to New York and um, started working in, uh, in Connecticut in, in the boats and uh, learning more crafts from, from other craftsmen. And because my, my ideas that I had when I was in school, I had so many ideas, but I didn't have any means or resources to actually Make these things possible. So um, it was it was early on that I decided to turn to the trades in order to um, to get that to start. So when I moved out there, um, I had been doing strictly metal sculptures, and um, out on the um, eastern plains of uh, of the uh, of the Rockies, uh, there's, a, there's obviously a large agricultural community, and it was a big concern at the time about the consolidation and the corporatization of the uh, farms and basically food production in general. So it was a really, and since my studio was on a farm, it was really obvious to me. So I made Seed Spreader, a piece that uh, uses violence and fear and, uh, and threatening to talk about food production and, and the uh, dissemination of seeds and, and the control of seeds. So, um, and I was really, I was, I was young and strong, so I could lift these things up and keep them down now. I'm kind of, uh, <laughs> kind of wishing that, you know, and I wasn't so strong back then. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, yeah, so I um, made that out there and, uh, and and brought it back. And then, let's see, we'll, uh, we'll run the next one. So I came back and um, I got a job. I've been around boats my whole life, um, being growing up in New England. And, um, so uh, I decided to come back and apply for a job at a boatyard, really having no actual experience 
building boats, uh, working on them. But he accepted me, and I got to work with an 85-year-old carpenter for about four years, and it was it was really priceless. And um, I was thinking a lot about you know environmental change and 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 in the environment and the talk that's going on about global warming and all these things. So I decided to make a piece combining the the, the beauty of boat building and, and, the, and, the, and the craftsmanship and the technique, and uh, and then also you know move, move working in the idea of uh, temperature and, and climate change. And so in this piece, there's uh, two ice, there's two pieces of ice that go in the calipers in the center, and um, once the ice melts, uh, the uh, the uh, hanging piece will go from being dynamic to uh, to static. It will stop from swinging and fall down stand itself up and the imprint falls away, really changing the whole idea of the piece, um, but using an unpredictable environmental trigger to, uh, to, to move that along. And seed spreader, it, it, it's, it has a, a piece of wood that burns out to, to activate it, but it's a, it's a little bit more, um, I think it was, a, it was a better combination of the two on, on this one. And. And then after uh, after that, I, um, I moved into um, conservation mental, bringing more of the uh, fiberglass techniques that I had uh, begrudgingly learned, having subjected to boats. Uh, at first, I really didn't enjoy the, uh, the material or the, the smell or the, the itch and, uh, and the difficulty to work with it. But uh, I learned its uh, amazing abilities to uh, produce things. So um, so this piece uses uh, this piece uses fuel. To, uh, to trigger it, and uh, it is filled on top with, uh, with fuel, and then <coughs> the fuel is, uh, is burned out. It's a weight-sensitive trigger, and it deploys a cloak and covers itself. And it kind of gave me ideas of, of the differences between you know, where we get our fuel from, how we, how we go about it, and the, and the cultural differences a little bit. This is, this is nudity, or it's, 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 it's obvious, it's bare, and then when the fuel is gone, the party's over, the ship is, is done, and it deploys a cloak and, and shrouds itself uh, from head to toe, you know, removing all that, all that beauty that, that maybe art could be, but going to someplace else, you know, transcending um, to, a different, to a different place. I've always thought when I was in school that I love static pieces, and I do a lot of figure sculptures and figure drawing, and I have a lot of respect for it in the classic techniques to make art, but I always felt like I wanted sculptures to do something more for a moment to live in, in my world and in my environment. And then whether that's being so dangerous that it, it creates a space for itself that, that, that it dominates for that moment and it's, it's, you have no doubt that it's, that it's alive, it's, it's living. Or uh, you know something more subtle and small like this. But for a second it's living on, on your time and in its space. And um, so it's, it's been something that, that, uh, that I've been pursuing on that. So, and this piece took me the longest out of all to make. It took me about two and a half years to develop how to get a 20-foot circumference cloak to come out of this capsule. Um, since I really don't use any math or uh, I have no formal engineering background, um, it's very difficult for me to uh, get help. Easily. I have to pretty much figure it out in my own head because I didn't really know how I would communicate with a classically trained engineer. So. Um, so then, this is uh, this is transcendence, and um, this piece um, is filled with sand, and it, it comes out of a series of line drawings and small sculptures that I made. And after almost a two and a half year de ordeal with uh, conservation, I decided that I would really simplify things. And it was it was time to be able to do that, and so I just wanted to do something that was uh, very free flowing and, and form uh, more of a <coughs> gestural figure sculpture almost. Or figure drawing rather. So this piece is filled with sand, and um, once the sand empties from this vessel that you see up there, uh, it will then release a, a trigger, and the entire piece will fall apart in three pieces. And it's probably the closest I got to actually taking a piece for me from a sculpture to something I consider not a sculpture, just pieces of a sculpture, and um, and that and that leap from uh, from its former self. So, 
So that's that piece, and that's made out of fiberglass and, um, and stainless steel. And then, Is Avon Reservoir. This is uh, my newest piece, and um, it is uh, made out of fiberglass and, and wood and, uh, and steel. And it hangs on the wall in this shape, and is filled with water from this vessel on the bottom. And the water stays in there until it slowly drips out. And depending on how much water you can put in there, it can go up between five minutes to about an hour and a half or, or two hours or so. And then it slowly creeps up, sometimes quickly and sometimes slowly, up the wall and, uh, and changes its just basic design and form. But um, it's, 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 a, it's, it's taken me this long, <coughs> over this 12 year period, to get to the point where I can make something simple uh, and quickly and, and have, have a good relationship with it uh, as an artist. So um, it's, uh, it's, it's a big leap for me to be able to be making smaller, smaller pieces. So, and this is, this is just a, a show of, uh, actually, Ryan's in the background there. Uh, this is one of the, the latest art fair I was at. It's just become a pretty big part of, uh, of my, my art career now, is, is getting hicked up into the art fair scene. And that's really, uh, it's really been an exciting opportunity. It's something I never expected uh, and on this start of the journey to, uh, to uh, be an artist that, uh, that you would be able to almost be, you know, you travel around. It's almost like being in a rock band, going on a tour or something. You get, you get these, these small perks you get as an artist. There's not many, but you, uh, there's, there's a few of them. And, and, some, and one of them is being able to travel and, and, uh, and going out and, and seeing large, large rooms with hundreds of different galleries with so many different ideas of art going on contemporary right now. And it's a, it's a very exciting scene and place to be. And I enjoy it very much. So, uh, so that's that. And this is a, a picture of my studio in Connecticut. Uh, you can see Transcendence is not really finished back there. But uh, just a little idea where, the, uh, where my church is. And this is a piece that um, I'm proposing to do for a, a sculpture park in Queens. Uh, it's called Socrates. And it's going to be my largest, uh, largest piece uh, at this time. Maybe about 18 feet all together, and it's working off similar ideas of the Avian Reservoir, uh, in that it is filled with water, and then over a 12-hour a period, it changes from having its arms up above its head like that and opening up, and then it's refilled and goes through the cycle. And it has roots that go into the ground, steel roots, to kind of limit the impact on the, on the soil and the earth around it. So um, I look forward to um, trying to start this piece in the next year. And uh, here's a video of it. It has uh, three arms. And it'll be wood, fiberglass, and stainless steel. Uh, so it's going to be a combination of, of many of my, my tricks so far. So, so yeah, so how much time do I have? I <laughs> didn't time you, Mark. <laughs> Great. Okay. Um, are there any quick questions for Mark? We'll run. We'll go ahead and move on. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Yeah. We'll have an opportunity to ask your long questions uh, at the end of the program. Um, our second artist is uh, Dean Nesbitt. Uh, also known as Disney. Um, Disney is a native of Florida, <coughs> has lived and maintained a studio in the Williamsburg area of Brooklyn since 1997. Uh, he's very active in the art scene of both Brooklyn and Manhattan. He's a frequent participator in projects conducted by the Perpetual Art Machine, a nonprofit organization dedicated to the promotion of new media art. He holds a BFA in sculpture and mixed media from Florida State University, Tallahassee, and was enrolled, uh, was awarded an international residence, residency at the Experimental <coughs> Television Center at Alfred University in New York, where he worked with the Wobulator, Nam June Paik's pioneering video synthesizer. 
an invention of Pake's in collaboration with Abe. Recent 2007 exhibitions include Video Art in the Age of the Internet at the Chelsea Art Museum in New York, curated by Nina Pelosi and the Perpetual Art Machine founders, 10 Plus 10, Mark de Pucherdon Gallery, Basel, Switzerland, and Particulate at Lump West Gallery, Eugene, Oregon. Uh, Disney has also uh, had a solo show at the galleries of Peeler, University of DePaul, Indiana, this past August, and a show at Pace University in New York City uh, in September. Other exhibitions include uh, Hey Hot Shot, 2003, the Jen Beckman Gallery, Obscure Sexual Habits of Wireless Data, 2005, a one-person exhibition at Romo Gallery in Atlanta, Georgia, an unframed first look, 2004, curated by Cindy Sherman, Jack Pearson, and Adam Foos at the Sean Kelly Gallery in New York. So, Disney, welcome. Thank you. Hello. First of all, you probably are all wondering why I have an unpronounceable symbol for a name. I'd like to explain that to you a little bit. Um, when I left Florida in 97, I decided that my art, my God-given name, did not describe enough about who I am, where I'm from, and what my work is about. So I decided when I left that I'd create a new persona about my work. It started off initially as Disney NASA born. And when I left Tallahassee, I had no interest whatsoever in technology, electronics, video art work. I was a pretty classical welder and sculptor and painter. I moved to New York, all that changed immediately. Um, in 97, as you know, it was a real important time for the internet and web development and distribution of ideas. Um, I was working with some collaborators that were helping me to distribute my work via the internet. And I quickly realized that they are holding my hands. And if I don't learn how to use technology, firstly, for the distribution of my ideas, then I'm gonna be held always responsible to these other parties. So I quickly decided that I would start to learn web development. And I did not go to class, I did not take any classes in college that involved technology. I actually at one time said that uh, it was kind of a, a time period where people just started to work with video artwork and electronic media. And I remember saying some really stupid things, one of them being, well, you know, if the power goes out, then where does your artwork exist? And, you know, kind of poking fun at this new media. But then in New York, I realized being in such an important hub as that city and trying to distribute ideas and seeing these new companies and internet marketing and, and you know, ways that you can create a network of collaborators via a global marketplace, that this was a really interesting place to be. So I immediately started to learn how to do web development and to think about ideas and technology, which quickly spun into how do I incorporate these new medias into my tool set? So I don't consider myself a new media artist or a technology artist, but a sculptor, a painter, a photographer. But I stack these on top of my tool set with welding, painting, sculpture. So I have the ability to have as much flexibility as possible to develop my ideas into the mediums appropriate for the work. So when I left Florida, like I said, I was purely doing painting. But through interfacing with technology, I realized pretty quickly that the city was filled with this voluminous, invisible life form that we weren't thinking about how to visualize. So I started thinking, how can you, as an artist, visualize the unseen? Because technology was also, at that same time, trying to deal with visualization, even now more so with genetics and nanotechnology looking at the unseen, looking at the small, trying to visualize patterns that have never been seen before. So I started to decide, well, you know, I've painted this entire time since school. Maybe I can make paintings that will try to talk about the relationship of technology, these abstract ideas. I mean, what does it look like when you push the power button on your computer inside? Or to write data? Or to send an email? Is there a visualization for this type of interface? Or how about the cell phone transponders littered throughout New York? Are these rolling like crashing waves to the city? Are they uh, pornographic, organic type uh, dispersion of ideas? Because we're looking at the sky continuously and we see this very minuscule landscape without 
I have any idea about this sky filled with this energy and this data. So I started immediately saying, hmm, this is a very interesting place to be. Let's try to visualize what's going on here. But I was making very gorgeous paintings, in my opinion, and taking very poor photographs of them. So one day in the studio I said, you know, maybe I should start from scratch and decide how am I going to really portray these images. So I said, you know, the first way to start from scratch is to break all the rules. I took all the photo lights out of the studio, every light, and I decided to do a long exposure shot of one of my paintings. And during that time I would do some slide projections, smoke machine, mini explosions, um, hand lighting with LEDs, over a five minute period of time to try to create this um, idea of technology. And the very first photograph that I take, um, I did a little bit of fashion photography, so I had a high-res digital camera, and I was familiar with the, the ideas behind photography as uh, a commercial aspect. So the very first frame of the image that I took my digital camera took a painting that was interesting into a painting that was extremely exciting. The colors were different, the mood was different, there was energy, there was motion, there was abstract ideas on the surface of the photograph that I could never achieve in painting in the first place. And I'll make one of these up to show you what I'm talking about. <coughs> they were called data ecosystems. This is a photograph of one of them. Basically what this is is a temporary installation. Um, and it's, this photograph took five minutes to create. As you can see, there's miniature explosions, fog machines, moisture, water, um, hand lighting LEDs, self-illumination wired inside of it. But they were very temporary sets. They were only for the purpose of photography. But getting incorporated with some commercial galleries and talking to dealers and critics and curators, there's a lot of interest in the scale, the material quality, what these particular pieces really meant. So I started to have some ideas about, well, maybe there is some sculptural components here where I can go ahead and try to develop some sculptural work. Because I'm you know, based in sculpture, but in New York, it's very impossible in my studio to create large sculpture or for me to weld and stuff. So I started to look towards new materials and new technologies pretty immediately. And um, kind of what happened is since I had all these pieces, kind of like um, a set for a movie or something like that. So I had a tremendous amount of these pieces sitting around the studio that I never considered using in any other way. So the first group of sculptures that I made that were archival were very improvisational. I mean, I had these pieces already and I just kind of really free form made a nice small series of sculptures and it was very liberating and very exciting. And when I started to work into sculpture again, I realized how exciting and interesting it was for me to develop three-dimensional objects as opposed to two-dimensional objects. And then the same ideas that I had in these photographs, these temporary sets, these uh, over-manipulated lighting scenarios, almost like a Hollywood movie, how can I incorporate these light scenarios into the physical sculptures themselves? So slightly after these photographs were made, I started to wire LEDs, cold cathodes, sound, and things into these small archival permanent sculptures. Right about the same exact time, I was making video for the purpose of video. But I was showing these videos on my iPod at the art fairs, at the galleries, and things like that to have dialogue about them. It's a really strange story. I was talking to a curator in Scope Hampton's maybe about a year and a half from now. And the curator said, well, this would be very interesting if we could show these into the, in a gallery space where it was not a handheld interface. It was something more than that. And I just blurted out off the top of my head, well, I'm working on a series of iPod sculptures. And I went home and I said, what the hell is an iPod sculpture? <laughs> and I started working on, you know, trying to develop an idea how would I make an infinitely looping wall hanging video sculpture. And at the same exact time this was happening, I got invited to uh, the Experimental Television Center, which I encourage you to look up online. It's a very interesting place. They have an extraordinary amount of equipment there, both new and old equipment. It's kind of forged together to create video artwork. So most of the students at that time in the Experimental Television Center at the residency were trying to create video through these through synthesis and development video in the space. But they had a Nanjing Pei piece there, and it was a, a gorgeous, beautiful piece um, that synthesized video. I'm going to pull it up. But it was also um, gorgeous, three case television set, 
with some weird knobs on it and everything else. And so I took the director aside and I asked him, do you think it'd be possible for me to think outside the boundaries of video on here and actually create a temporary environment on Nam June Pick's piece? And they talked about it for a little bit, went off to their discussion, and thought I was a little bit crazy and maybe I wanted to damage the piece. But they came back to me and said, yeah, let's, you know, we can do that, that'd be cool. So this piece here is a temporary installation, the same way I did my photographs, on top of the Nam June Pig Wobulator piece. And this is a five minute exposure time as well. It's fog, smoke, slide projections. Uh, this piece growing out of the screen here is actually a suction cup, very temporary. Everything was kind of clay and wax, kind of just embedded into the Nam June Pig piece as a temporary set once again. But I left the Experimental Television Center thinking about the handheld video and the temporary sets. I was like, hmm, I'm a sculptor. I enjoy working with video. Maybe I can integrate video into my sculptural pieces. So I, you know, same time where I talk about the iPod sculptures, which I'll pull up some iPod sculptures. This is one of the newer ones. I actually decase and take apart the iPods and trick them into playing nice because um, Steve Jobs does not really want us to use these as content development, and which is very frustrating for me. This is a vessel for buying and selling content, which I'm completely against. So I decided that I would take these apart and refashion them into doing something more interesting. And um, this is, as you can see, it's um, sculptural materials, but in a different way. Think about fiber optic networks and the way of transmitting data. I decided maybe I can make these ad hoc networks out of fiber optics that are used purely for artistic purposes, aside from communication. So these things basically are infinite looping, wall hanging video sculptures, but on a personal scale. And I find it very important. <coughs> at, the, at the time period I started working with these, the iPod was five years old. There's over 100 million people in the world globally that had iPods. And I found it bizarre that not one person had the idea to use this as an artwork. And I actually had commented in an interview with Scope New York, well, if Warhol was alive, would he not be interfacing with iPods, creating iPods, working with iPod sculptures? It's so embedded in a culture. It is pop culture. And it's redefined the way that we deal with music and content, but in a mobile place. The Amazon Pig was working with the Catholic Ray, the first artist to do that, but in a very stationary type archival, heavy situation. I wanted to go to this more personal scale, a more intimate interface, a more mobile idea of, of how to work with video sculpture. And I see it running in a very parallel way with him, being the first one to work with the Casual Ray, and taking this new form that's turned the old TVs on its head into my artwork. But at the same time this has happened, LCD screens are coming on board, flat screens are coming on board, and I started realizing that I should utilize these too. I go into Best Buy and passion. There's 50 screens on the wall, and these are made for you to bring home and digest content, and not to think about <clears throat> it is a raw material for artistic purposes. So I immediately decided I was going to start messing with plasmas, LCD screens, and things like that. Although this piece here is different. This is an 11 iPod iPod sculpture. And I thought it would be important to cluster them, work them together as a network to create one consolidated piece. <coughs> but I'm going to skip over to the LCD screens. When I first started making the video sculptures, I realized right away, and one of the things that I'm very passionate about in my artwork is trying to continually evolve my ideas and work with really modern materials. So I said, hmm, I don't think anyone's ever worked on a screen of a violin screen before. And it'd be very important for me to create sculpture that actually was video, that integrated into the video. So if you look closely at these pieces, you can see that we're still working in the same paint. Nothing's really changed here. There's still semi-temporary sets, yet this particular hardware and the piece of the sculpture are also photographed and layered multiple times in After Effects so that the sculptural components lead into the components into the plasma screen, but in motion and with sound. It's a really important turning point in what I was doing. And it was exciting because I had never seen anyone actually work on the screen 
before. And it was just kind of random luck that I even developed materials that would stick to a, a telomere screen or a plasma screen. I had no idea the first one I met. I said, oh, maybe I'll put something on the screen. I'm going to transport. I'm going to get there. The pieces are going to be you know, completely torn apart, or it's going to fall off one day or something like that. But oddly enough, the, the resins that I decided to work with the very first time stuck so well to the textured materials for consumer electronics already that um, one of the first pieces that I decided to work on, I had decased the LCD screen and I had broken it. So I said, well, let's see what happens. You know, how rigid and tough is this thing? And I tried to break it. And the resin I could never relieve from the screen. I could break it, but only at the weakest part of the sculpture itself. And which is very strange luck for me to be able to stumble upon something that functions so well as sculpture materials on LCD screens. Actually, um, one of these pieces is in a blossom in here. I'm very excited about the idea of clustering these. Same way you would go into Best Buy and see multiple screens and clusters of screens. Um, I thought that that was important at the time to build many networks of video sculptures together. But this entire time that I'm trying to work on these pieces, um, obviously I'm having to develop my craft as a video artist as well. And only until recently, it was only video sculpture for video sculpture purposes. But through development of video and developing my craft of video, I realized that video itself in clusters and the idea of video working as sculpture, not necessarily it would have to have a sculptural component to it. This, video. this is one of three channel video pieces in the gallery right now. And this is on the Perpetual Art Machine, and I encourage all of you that are interested in the video to not only become a member, but to upload some images and some videos. It's free, you just set up a username and password and account. Um, I believe now there's over a couple thousand artists on this, and it's a great networking thing. I've had quite a few shows and definitely met a lot of artists that I respect and collaborate with to do this network. It started off as an art project. But now it's become a lot more than that. And uh, you'll see when you get home, there's all types of video on here, from figurative and documentary to uh, visionary and three-dimensional video. So there's a three-channel piece in, the, in here right now. And it was very interesting for me to start to think about how multiple screens can create one dynamic composition. Uh, incorporating sound. Does this have sound by any chance, man? This, I didn't know well, why it no sound, sound okay. Yeah, sorry. Well, you'll be able to visualize it in the gallery. This is the first time I've hung it this way, actually. It was shown uh, initially in the Chelsea Art Museum in a 50 foot projection, and they were all the same size projected. And then after that, at the Paul University, I showed them in a cluster of 19 inch screens. But the most successful exhibition of these so far is in the gallery right now. I, used a 32 inch plasma in the middle and two smaller 19s. Um, and I hung it in such a way that it related to my very newest piece, which I don't really want to talk about too much because it's very new. But I would like to talk about the ideas of the very new. I was in Spain over the holidays, and I've been many times in the last few years in Spain. I'm, I'm very passionate about Spain right now. I'd love to be able to go see the Prada and, and be in you know, the Reina Sofia and look at really cutting edge artwork in Spain and, and develop ideas about the past and the future. But at the same time, I was going to Spanish churches, attending masses, and interfacing with the culture and the religious history in Spain. So after this last trip, which was over Christmas time for me, um, I came home at well, Christmas mass, let's start off there. I had my video camera feed. I recorded all the audio from the choir, from the organist, from the Spanish incantations. And I just felt really inspired by the idea that this was a place where you would come to sort of have an idea about spirituality by the grandioseness of the architecture and the uh, adornment of the pieces and the altarpiece and the sound. It's really a multimedia spectacle in, in its own interesting way. So the ideas in mass were just spinning through my head. Wow. I'm visualizing data, which is an unseen thing but isn't spirituality an unseen thing as well? 
So when you go in the gallery and see my very first piece, it's very new, I've had very little feedback on it, and I would appreciate any of you if you have some comments about it. I decided to work with, first off, I haven't done figurative work since I left Florida. It's been 10 years. I moved to New York, my work changed completely. I decided I was going to neglect the figure 100%. I was going to go into these more abstract and edge ideas. So this is the first piece I've made in over a decade that was actually figured in. And it's the first piece I've ever made that was religious in any sort of way. But not religion in the way that you would think, but my religion. It's an expanded blossom in three dimensions of a crucifix of the ideas of Christ. And my own spiritual beliefs are like that. They're a hybrid. I believe in alternate realities and infinity and um, you know these, these ideas that I believe actually are part of Christianity, but we have such a, a shallow view of what religion <coughs> be. It's you're so pigeonholed with these ideas of religion in this particular way. So the piece in the gallery is really important for me to think about expanding of religion. How does religion focus, or how does religion become part of a new technology, <coughs> a new visualization, you know, visualization technologies? Is there a congruency, or does technology completely um, deny the power of religion in the first place? So it's a very interesting transition, and uh, it's so new, it's very difficult for me to talk about. And i got to be honest with you, when I was creating the piece, I wasn't quite certain that I was happy with it, you know, for several, for several reasons. But the underlying concept and the reason for bringing it here are develop ideas of <coughs> this to expand the genre into another place. Sometimes you don't always have to bring a piece that you feel is completely successful or completely finished, because that would pigeonhole you into the ideas that there's nowhere for that piece to go. But in essence, every time you exhibit your work, there's so much to be learned from your interface and dialogue with the other artists, critics, and curators that it evolves the pieces very quickly. And as Mark had mentioned earlier about traveling and doing affairs, it is very important, and, and for a lot of reasons. One of those reasons is, alone from being able to see a great survey of contemporary art internationally uh, in the marketplace, it's also a time period to look at your work and, you know, move back a little bit. The fairs are taxing. You would not believe how taxing it is to be in the fairs and talk about your work over and over and over again. I mean, you're giving so much of yourself away, but at the same time, you can also build upon your work by doing that. So I'd like to encourage you at certain times to exhibit unfinished pieces and pieces that are in development or sketches for pieces that will help to expand and evolve the work. Have I taking up too much time or am I doing pretty good over here? Uh, actually, I'd like to maybe have some questions here too, because I know some of this is confusing and you might want to have some questions how some of the pinnacle pieces transcend to other pieces and I'd be more than happy to answer those questions. Come on, someone's got one for me. You guys haven't even seen the work. Well, no, maybe I'll backtrack a little bit. Um, the initial pieces for trying to visualize wireless data um, still had the hardware components of the distribution of communications. I've transcended beyond that point. You know, it's like I'm saying, trying to visualize spirituality or trying to visualize abstract ideas about technology. Let me leave a little bit behind just trying to look at wireless data because it's not quite as interesting as it could be. So these first pieces, this is one of my first, this was actually predates the iPod sculptures. It was the video before the iPod sculptures. As you can see, I have, these are site-specific photographs. And I'm layered in, in After Effects in maybe 20 or 30 different layers. They all have sound. And um, these were my preliminary ideas of the blossoming of data. So it's interesting. I'm traveling around New York City. And of course, New York City is so dense with communication hardware. And you know, so dense even to a fact we have no idea what this, these technologies are going to do to humanity. And some people, especially on the West Coast, are very concerned about the frequencies of this data carrying signals and think that they can even cause harm to human beings. So I found it very exciting. This particular piece here was shot in 
leaving the South Hill. This is a North Carolina cell phone tower embedded on top of the water tower. So that's an actual environmental. This is an act. This piece right here is an actual uh, water tower with a, and it's composited over 30 plus layers. And these lines here and stuff, some are made in green max, some are also made in real time. I mean, the same kind of long exposure effects you can do with photography can also do a video. Light lines, fog lines, projection lines, make create motion, create explosion, create miniature motion and macro movements. So it's super, super exciting. But along the way, I realized that the hardware could be less interesting than the abstract ideas of energy and data. So along the way, I started to slowly lose the hardware and think more about the ideas of motion and color. Perpetual Art Machine 2, if you decide you want to look, upload videos and stuff, this is a curated program. The Perpetual Art Machine travels to a lot of the important fairs in America and internationally. If you become part of their uh, organization and network, you could very well be curating some very important shows and programs. I mean, they go everywhere from, you know, uh, documentary to figurative to who knows what. And they always look in through their member list and network list to create curated, intelligent video shows. You can see these ones too, I'm still stuck in the ideas that they obscure sexual habits of wireless data. Like I said before, you know, the, how does data replicate? Is it organic tangles of flesh? Does it, does it act like that? Or does it act, you know, more like um, dispersion of seeds or pollination of a flower? Because in nature, data is connected to organic waves called carrier waves. So what's the difference between data and the organic nature? How can we tie information to an organic nature in the first place? Which spawned a tremendous of ideas from my composition as well to think about how does nature replicate? How does nature distribute ideas? How does nature pollinate itself? And then as I travel, I was inspired too because these same antiquated hardware for distribution of technology are international. And we're all using these. For me, technology is always obsolete. It's evolving so quickly. The second you can buy something in Best Buy or purchase something on a consumer level, it's already antiquated. So for me, I'm always thinking about these ideas of how the lifespan of information, the lifespan of technology, and if, why are we are buying products that are already antiquated? I mean, even with your iPods and stuff, I know you've had, probably had problems with your battery and the life of your iPod or your other devices. It's very frustrating. And as I'm doing these projects, I started to realize, let's switch up a little bit here, that um, there's a whole upset with the over-marketing of technology and consumer electronics that are already antiquated and semi-useless and don't last very long. There's a whole group of artists doing really bizarre things, like smashing computer screens. Uh, and these, these young people that are making these on YouTube, this is just pop culture ideas, they don't realize how relevant their ideas are for conceptual artists. I mean, they're hacking Furbies, microwaving iPods. Some, some kids come out really excited from the store. Only if one time work. Why would young people spend time to make videos about going up technology? I realize it's a really um, parallel thing to what I'm working on. And I find it exciting. I find these really conceptual fine art pieces. And these young people are just trying to voice their thing. Did they ever do anything exciting there? <laughs> Right, well, I 
think I'd probably go over my lifetime period, but I'd be more than happy to have a personal <coughs> interface and dialogue with each and every one of you in front of the pieces if you have any questions. And before I leave, it's very important for me to thank John and Diane there, absolutely. And Ruth is amazing. And she's really out there in the community to find people doing interesting work. And you gotta imagine how hard and dedicated she has to work to come out and find things to bring here to enlighten you. And she's done a fantastic job. And over the, the course of trying to develop this work, and Ruth has become a really good friend of mine. I think she's an amazing lady. I'd like to thank her very much for coming here.
and I think all of us, Mark in particular, the focus on systems, which is something that in my work I'm very interested in. Um, the work that uh, you'll see, and this is actually an early version of uh, a piece that I have up in there right now. Um, pretty much everything that, that I work on at the moment is, um, I don't call it sculptural so much as uh, I call it systems-based, and there's, uh, I don't make that up, that uh, comes from many, many years ago. Um, but the notion of, of designing with technology, and not designing things, but designing systems, designing uh, art that changes and evolves rather something that is, or is that something that is formal and static, and, and obviously you get that in Mark's work um, to a great extent. Uh, and this is actually the, uh, the focus on just the potential in kind of the hidden interstices of uh, our society and the technology that is all around us, but has kind of uh, worked its way into our environments to such a degree that we've kind of lost the magic and like that's kind of what I do like I see that magic like that's that's kind of what I work with I work with uh, robotics technologies mechatronics technologies essentially um, sensing and control systems so computers that um, that do things, and uh, the systems that I build have lots of computers and uh, lots of little things, and all of those little things interact together to beget a complexity that uh, will be difficult. <laughs> 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 there it is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, so yeah, that, that happens <laughs> more often than I'd like to. Um, but uh, essentially, the, the notion that uh, it's kind of like a society. Uh, you know, nobody can predict what's going to be interesting next week. Nobody's going to predict like, you know, where society moves, because society has uh, what are called emergent properties. And uh, those are things that see the work in there and uh, basically it's probably most useful for me to like just quickly explore what you're or explain to you where you're going to see uh, everything that I work with right now is uh, a series of a network of computers okay and these are what's typically called embedded systems so they're the computers that are in every electronic device that you own that's well I'd say it's not your computer but your computer actually has other computers inside it besides just its processing. Your cars have, you know, literally like tens of these little computers controlling all sorts of different things. And this is a technology, it's a medium, it's a capability that has kind of, it, it almost slipped by us, I think, from an artistic standpoint. It feels like it certainly has. And they're all around us, you know, they're everywhere. And yet, our ability to actually work with them, like, they're difficult little buggers to kind of do things with, but there's amazing things that you can do because uh, you can, it's kind of like getting a bunch of people together in a room and, you know, having the ideas swirl around. That's kind of what I do with my work. Like I take software and I take hardware and I take some ideas and I try and sort of sculpt some behavior, some quality out of that system, um, whether it's some type of, uh, effect or movement or uh, motion or you know something that reminds you of something that uh, you know, you've seen in the real world uh, yeah that's uh, that's basically what I do I'm, I'm not firing on all cylinders I haven't had a lot of sleep but, uh, <laughs> I apologize for that and, I, and I, it's also like I'm like and it's right over there and I'm not really sure <laughs> specific questions, or certainly when you're in there and you have a chance to take a look. Um, I love talking about, uh, you know, how I do, what it is that I do. And, um, yeah, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to, to get into it. With you. So.
this beautiful exhibition. And these three worked very, very hard to put together. Uh, and I'm truly grateful to have them here. And, and I hope you all enjoy uh, what you'll see in the press gallery tonight. And please feel free to talk to um, our three visiting artists. They're, they're, they're engaging people. They're happy to be here. And, and uh, they've had a really wonderful time in Chattanooga so far already. Uh, and they want to meet more. So all they had is work. <laughs> they work very hard. <laughs> uh, so um, I'd like to invite you into the uh, lobby in the press gallery. We have a, a light reception waiting for you. And, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you.